Hi, it's Naomi Lawrence, and I'm here with Mona Sadapur, and we are discussing her article on delayed onset nodules to differentially cross-link hyaluronic acids, comparative incidence, and risk assessment. Uh, so perhaps you could just start with a summary, a quick summary of the article. Sure. So the article focuses on assessing the safety and the, and the incidence for nodule formation with a newer class of fillers that are made up of a specific type of technology called Vicross technology, and looking to see if these classes of filler are at a higher risk for delayed onset nodule reactions in patients compared to other traditionally um, non-Vicross technology of fillers. And what did you find? So what we found was that compared to um, other NASHA or um, non-animal non stabilized hyaluronic acid, the Vicross family of fillers are in fact at a higher risk for having these delayed reactions. We did this in two ways. We looked at both um, what the risk was within our practice over a 12 month period. And we also calculated the risk based on the FDA studies when these um, fillers were originally approved. And we did that based on the seed, FDA seed studies. So being a devil's advocate, with all the good hyaluronic acid fillers on the market, why use a hyaluronic acid filler with Vicross technology um, when, we, when we know that there's a higher incidence of delayed nodules? So I think that's a great question, and obviously it's a personal one for each provider. I, um, I think the reason that these products were initially um, brought to the market was to offer products that are longer lasting and have better cross-linking technology to what was previously available on the market. And the truth is that there are many patients who actually really love these products and there are wonderful properties about them that make them great choices for both providers and patients. Um, but perhaps, again, sort of in light of this data as well as other data that's been reported in the literature, it's important to counsel patients that there may be at a slightly increased risk for having a possible reaction with these fillers compared to other fillers, even though they may not have a reaction. Although you saw no nodules with Voluma and Velour, there are anecdotal reports of these also having an increased risk of delayed nodules. What are your thoughts? So that is correct. And actually following the original study results that were published, we have continued to collect data. And we found subsequent to that study that um, in fact, we did have one report of Velour nodules and another one to um, HA Voluma. So since the article came out, there has been um, one of each. However, what we know based on our data, in addition to the reports from the uh, results of the FDA studies, is that, is that the risk for nodules for those specific fillers is lower than HA Vobella. Do you feel since Vobella is a product that's injected often into the lips, that there are some location specific qualities um, as far as the predominance of nodules. Yeah, so um, it's, it turns out that um, most of the HA Vobella that were injected in the practice and, and so subsequently were included in the study were uh, HA Vobella that was injected in the perioral area. Hence, all the vo uh, nodules that we ended up seeing were in the perioral area. However, there is study um, that is in dermatologic surgery from a few years ago, which report the nodules in the periocular area. These, this is an outside the United States study that was published. So. Um, it's probably somewhat location dependent. Now, my hypothesis is that the, you know, people ask, well, why is it that, you know, the HA Vobella has a higher risk? I, this may not explain why they could occur in the periocular area, but in the perioral area, um, it is a highly mobile area and we tend to move it a lot and the HAs do tend to metabolize more frequently there. And so it is possible that the fillers that are being placed in those areas where there is a lot of movement can potentially get um, metabolized into smaller fragments of HA, which based on the study we know has a pro inflammatory role, not based on our study, but based on results in immunology studies. So that could be a reason of why we're seeing it more commonly, but in our practice, we just tend to use Vobella in the oral area. 
I guess it's also possible that it's just more evident there because of the, you know, sort of the quality and texture of skin in that area. Maybe when you're talking about um, Vicross technology out on the cheek, it's just thicker skin. Maybe it's harder to see. That is correct. And, you know, obviously within the perioral area, we're not placing those fillers. It is much more readily visible, felt by patients. So perhaps we're picking it up more quickly or more readily. Um, and what we do know is that a lot of these reactions can also be dependent based on volume. So the higher amount of um, volume that's injected in a particular area also increases your risk for having those reactions. So even if you were to get a tiny nodule, maybe to the vol voluma in the cheeks, you may be less likely to pick it up, perhaps compared to the perioral area. So why don't you, if you could, discuss the non-infectious ideology of the nodules. Talk to me a little bit more about what you think the pathophysiology is of the development. Okay. So um, the truth, so first of all, we should know that, you know, this is a retrospectively done study and there's no in vitro data supporting sort of why we're potentially seeing these reactions. The, I know that there's a lot of active research ongoing into figuring out what the etiology is, but um, what we do know is that the patients who presented to our practice with the reactions all presented within sort of the, the same four to six month period. At the beginning, we did manage the filler sort of based on a traditional algorithm of using antibiotics, um, which in our case, we use clarithromycin, three, 500 milligrams BID for three weeks, and there was no reaction happening. There was no improvement. In fact, when we started to even use hyaluronidase by itself, there was no improvement in the fillers, and it wasn't until we actually started to use and add intralesional catalog or steroid where the nodules started to diminish and improve. So although we did not do any biopsies to actually test out based on cultures, um, all the filler nodules resolved um, with the hyaluronidase and ILK injection. And in fact, once we saw that the antibiotics was not making a difference, we stopped using antibiotics and all the fillers, all the nodules went away. So there's no culture proof that they're not infectious, but we believe, again, based on mechanism of the technology, it's probably unlikely that, you know, Subsequent to that paper, by the way, we've collected more data and three additional patients ended up having reactions to the Vobella, bringing it to a total of eight patients um, and bringing the incidence up to 1.6% compared to the 1% that's in the paper. So it was unlikely that all of those patients within three to four month period ended up having an infectious etiology. And again, uh, knowing that they all improved with hyaluronidase and ILK was probably pointing to the fact that these were likely immunogenic reactions to the Vicross technology. One of the things that I've heard anecdotally is that um, a remote infection can possibly set off this autoimmune response to mm -hmm. the filler. Is that something that you all saw or have you heard that? I absolutely have heard that and um, in actually preparing the manuscript and doing a lot of reading, uh, triggers that have been shown with these types of reactions have been anything ranging from, as you said, infections, whether they're viral in etiology, even vaccinations, um, dental procedures, there's some evidence that suggests even a transient bacteremia, especially closer to the time of injection, can play a role. So the way that I think about it and I explain to the patient is anything that can trigger or wake up the immune system can sort of heighten the overall systemic immune system such that the body in a genetically predisposed or um, perhaps immunologically predisposed individual can trigger then the reaction to the filler. So that is definitely something that could be related. In our case, unfortunately, majority of the patients did not have an identifiable trigger. Only one patient had had a dental procedure close to the time of the injection. So any plans to extend the study for the future? You, I thought you maybe mentioned that you all would continue to monitor this, is that yes. the case? Yes, we are continuing to collect data prospectively. Um, it was important to keep things very consistent and um, we know based on the reports, uh, the experience of not, not just our group, but other colleagues and what's been reported that these are delayed reactions. So um, in our study, it was on average of nine months that patients were coming into the office from the time of the first injection where they were seeing these reactions, but obviously that could continue. And sometimes you can see a reaction a year or even maybe longer after. 
So since the time of the study, um, we, as I mentioned, we um, identify three additional patients with Volbella reaction and one additional patient each to HA Volor and HA um, Voluma. We are continuing that and we, um, we're planning to do a five-year prospective follow-up just to sort of really um, hone in and see what pans out more long-term. Another thing I've heard is that um, it often takes more volume of hyaluronidase and more treatments with hyaluronidase to dissolve uh, the Vicross technology. Is this something you could comment on? Absolutely. So our first patient who presented with a reaction required a total of eight injection sessions for her nodules to resolve. Um, Thankfully, other patients required less, but every single patient required multiple sessions of treatment. So it is important for providers to all be aware that, you know, in, when you do see this reaction in the office, to not give up, to really make sure you counsel your patient and set up proper expectations so that they're aware that just one treatment is not going to get rid of all the reaction, to really have close follow-up and monitoring and have the patients come back, sometimes even on a weekly and sometimes even on a bi-weekly basis, twice a week, bring them back and just make sure, you know, you're kind of holding their hand through it and slowly working your way through the nodules and making the injections. And how do you determine what dose you're going to inject the nodule with? So um, we talked to colleagues when we saw these reactions and asked them who had, who had previously been managing these complications in their office. The average concentration for ILK and hyaluronidase that we used in the study was um, 2 to 3.5 mix per cc. So you want to keep the concentration low because obviously having multiple bounds of injection with ILK can have local Ad adverse effects, which you obviously don't want to add to the additional complication of what the patients are dealing with. So we kept the injection low, and we didn't feel that it was necessary to really do high dose injections. So right around two to two and a half mix per cc um, is what I tend to use uh, in my practice for management if, if I see and the reaction. That's the that's the injectable steroid. Exactly. But what about the hyaluronidase? So we mix them together. So based on the, the number of nodules that the patients had, you know, we would work to a final volume, whether it was one cc total that we were going to do with the mixture with the final concentration of the hyaluronidase and ILK mix being two to two and a half, sometimes three mix per cc. And you're using the human recombinant Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in describing how you treat these complications, it's mm -hmm. clear that this is a relatively time-consuming and costly uh, complication. Um, mm -hmm. Would you mind explaining to me a little bit about how you all have handled this, um, both um, uh, how you talk to the patient and maybe also how you approach uh, uh, the cost? Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because it is definitely an issue. There's one part which is the management of how do we make them go away and then there's the practice management standpoint of how do we handle the patients and the frustration that they may feel because obviously nobody wants to have this happen to them. And it should be said again, it's not that every patient who gets these products presents with these reactions, but if and when they do occur, um, we like to incorporate the BLAST method which is believing in the patient, listening, apologizing, satisfying, and thanking. So with each and every one of these patients who underwent the treatment, um, because it had happened at the practice, we obviously did not charge them for the treatment. We made sure that you know when they came in, we talked to them and we uh, sort of did everything we can in our power to reassure them that we're gonna be there through this whole process with them and make sure that they you know, have a resolution. And it is, I mean, it's, it, these are expensive modalities of treatment and it's unfortunately something that is a part of the practice of cos practicing cosmetic dermatology that we need to be able to manage it. Now, obviously, depending on where the complication occurred and who did the initial um, injection, I know that you know, some providers may choose to charge if they are not the initial provider who did the injection. But if it, was, if it happened at your office in your hands, then at least in our mind, you know, we treated the patients at no cost. <music>